this morning. Um, President Howard, can you please come up to here to the podium? Jesus Christ is risen today, hallelujah. hallelujah. Our triumphal and holy day, hallelujah. Who did once upon the cross, hallelujah. Suffer to redeem our lost, Thank you. 
Justice Association. We anticipated his his greetings, not greetings, his speech, his keynote speech yesterday. But I guess he will explain to you why he had double bookings yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I see he has brought his gracious wife so that we cannot um, penalize him too hard because the lady is here to, to pay penance as usual. Um, and it says, they, they say that the, in, in behind or beside a successful man is a successful woman. So the successful woman will be protecting him today from any kind of backlashes that he might deserve or not deserve, but he will defend himself, I'm sure. However, we're very happy to have with us, um, and that is not for the camera, whatever. The, the, I protect my president, and um, we're very proud to have you, sir, that you have really given up your Sunday morning. I know that you are very are the church go up and um, the past, um, no, I, he's laughing but I've been to his church and I know that he's um, very active and so we welcome you and we look forward to what you have to say to us this morning and also again to, to, to thank Dr. Clark for so ably fitting in a very excellent JTA member because you stood to the stood up to the plate and you did an excellent job. And as as Dr. Gomorrah said, you know the right things happen at the right time in the right place for the right person. So this is the right time for us to hear the president, and we had to hear um, Dr. Clark yesterday. So let us welcome our president. Good morning, brethren and sisters. As as trust as the trustee said, I'm a garden church goer. You 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 laugh because you recognize that there is a connotation that emanates from being a church. That I am an ardent Anglican, and I am also warden in my church. So not just church goer. Right, right, right. Right, Dr. Scott? <laughs> Colleagues, I must firstly apologize for the mishap that occurred yesterday. I too want to thank Dr. Clark. And when I came to the door, I heard the, 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 the reverend speak of him in a very handsome way. <laughs> The only reason I will not rebut it is because he stepped up to the plate and did a good job for me yesterday. So I want to thank you, Dr. Clark. <laughs> Colleagues, there are things that happen, and some of these are outside of our control, whether by accident or by intent. It was always my intention to be here. And Dr. Hamilton indicated that she would pull my toenails and my fingernails. And as such, I ensured I brought my defense. <laughs> and when she saw my lovely wife, she only smiled. So I think I'm off the hook. But colleagues, this morning, I want to talk to you on three basic topics, well, and, and very briefly. And I hope that the statements I will make will not cause your breakfast not to go down as well as you would have loved it. <laughs> but I want to indicate from the onset that despite the many negative criticisms that education and the education sector, and certainly the practitioners therein, have received in recent times, if the other sectors in Jamaican society performed as well as education did, then we would have no need for an IMF agreement. We continue to hear education being bombarded, non-performance, underperformance. But in one context, we are told that the system doesn't perform. But in the other context, by the same persons who beat the system down, you are hearing that we are unable 
to find student loans to adequately finance the number of persons who have matriculated. We are unable to find employment to facilitate the number of persons who have acquired tertiary education within the society. And then we stop to ask, how is it that the same persons who say the system is not performing are the same ones who can't perform at a standard so as to absorb the production of the system? We must, as educators, recognize that the arguments you hear must never always be internalized. The whole adage says it is a sign of an intelligent man to hear much and not believe all. It is important for us to recognize that over centuries, teachers have done remarkably well to ensure that tomorrow's generation is an artist. But I want to, instead of just finding fault, and point, pointing to where are the deficiencies, I want to be better than my previous self. And I want to, at this point, articulate what I think could be solutions to many of these problems. I want us to start off where it all begins, early childhood education. Amen. We have recognized that in this society, we have not had a shortage of places in early childhood education. We have been able, as a nation, by whatever means, most of these have been what we call veranda schools, or certainly where they are coming from. And I am not at this point bashing veranda schools, because they played a pivotal role in the developmental stage at that time. Yes. However, where we are now, it is going to be important for us to get it right the first time. And at this point, I borrow that saying from the Minister of Education. I hope that he will recognize that simply saying getting it right is by no means an indication that it will so be done. You can't indicate that we should get it right when the first budget you have to articulate, the early childhood education pie, is cut by $200 million. You can't intend to get early childhood education right if the revised estimates of expenditure see an additional cut in the early childhood budget. It is time for us not just to talk about it, but to be about it. We must not just say early childhood education is important, but in all that we do, we must ensure that we start it out in that correct manner. Now, when you consider how a child learns, it is grossly important for you to ensure that that child is given the right tool to begin with. How many of you have learned to type using both index fingers? I suspect that you are all expert typists using all your the simple analogy I would like to draw is for you to recognize that if you ever learned to type using both index fingers, as I did, the chances of you learning to type in a formal manner is significantly compromised. Because you would then be forced to unlearn that learned behavior and then to learn a new one. If we fail to provide students at the three to five age group with authentic learning experiences that are valid and that the concepts are clear and correct, we are going to find that we would have been creating persons for which remediation is necessary. And, and remediation is expensive. So first off, I would indicate that we need to pay primary focus on early childhood education. The other thing I would love for us to look at is the issue of the teaching of English as a second language. I have been in, 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 in forum, in a forum, many of those, and I have heard persons say, 
they hear teachers who are unable to pronounce H's. And they behave that, it, that, that there is somewhat of an intellectual block to your ability to pronounce H. But the idea of the mispronunciation of H by Jamaicans has nothing to do with your academic prowess. If you consider the issue of phonology, our first language does not constitute that pronunciation. The H is not a concept in, 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 in Jamaican Creole. Thereby, persons who learn Jamaican Creole as their first language will have a problem pronouncing it. As would be the same if their first language was another foreign language. Is that correct? Because we, we have two local languages. If their language was a foreign language in which that phonemic expression would have been absent. They would have had a challenge also adapting to the use of, of, of H in English. If you, if you listen to persons who are native speakers of other languages, they too have a challenge pronouncing H. It is the same situation that caused Jamaicans to ins insert vowels where none exist. Instead of saying Smith, we intend to say Sinit because in our, in our original phonemic expressions, there is always a vowel that splits the consonants. And I see my wife there smiling. She's a linguistics expert in one. She taught me all of these. <laughs> Therefore, what we must now recognize is that in trying to teach our students the accepted Jamaican English, it is going to be important for us to approach it from the standpoint that we approach all other concept knowledge-based ar arrangements. You must move from the known to the unknown. You must find out what is it that this person knows in order for you to chart the pedagogical process that will find that person gaining the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you want them to accomplish. So I would want us to look towards teaching English as a foreign language. The next beef I have and solution I will present is the matter of special needs education. Invariably, when the idea of special needs education comes about, we automatically think remediation. And that is so because within our context, Every time the idea of special needs education comes about, it is meant or it is used to talk about remediation. It is used to talk about those persons who have not gotten or grasped the particular concept. And this is good because there are going to be persons at that end of the spectrum. What we must recognize is that the move in education is no, no longer how bright you are. IQ intelligence to power you bright, multiple intelligence. We must recognize that the child who is able to run fast or kick a football, you recognize that there are significant mathematical calculations that go into kicking a football. When a child sees a ball coming towards him or her, that child must calculate the speed at which that ball is going. You, you must calculate the velocity. You must determine beforehand. You must make a mathematical judgment as to where will that ball land. And all those calculations are done taking account of the wind speed, the trajectory. You must determine how fast you must run and where you must put your foot in order to collect that ball. These are significant and advanced calculations that are done by the child without even thinking. As educators, we must harness this skill. We must harness this innate ability to do this kind of assessment. 
and we must then use it to augment, support, and develop the academic qualification that we would want to see them displace. But I don't want us to stop there. I want us to recognize that special needs education also exists at the other end of the spectrum. And this is where I have a significant challenge. We have no programs, no processes, and certainly to my, my knowledge, there is nothing in the context of the education system that caters to our students who are gifted. And like, like the remedial who will need specialized attention to develop themselves, the gifted also need specialized attention. They present a whole new spectrum of problems. A child who is academically astute runs the very clear and present risk of becoming an underachiever. That child becomes exceptionally bored with regular classroom routine. It is incumbent on the teacher. It is incumbent on all of us to see how best we can provide enrichment activities to ensure that we keep these students motivated. In the same way, nation building will not be advanced unless we seek to get the remedial up to productive level, it will also not be advanced unless we find a way of tapping into the skill sets of the exceptional. Colleagues, education is dynamic. Education must be clairvoyant in their perspectives. Educators must be clairvoyant. A number of years ago, and certainly when I attended school, and, and I know many of you are looking on me now and trying to determine when I attended school. Many moons ago. Many moons ago. Right, right Dr. Scott? <laughs> the, the, the common mistake that is made is that persons look on my handsomeness and mistake it for you. <laughs> but certainly, when I attended school, if you were bright, you did the sciences. And if you were not that academically advanced, you did the business subjects and agriculture. Certainly, in my short lifetime, I have seen where the not so bright who were relegated to doing business are now the employers of the bright ones who did the sciences. As educators, we must be clairvoyant. We must predict the future and as such, create our students to fit that reality. Google Jobs recently published a report where it indicated that over 60% of the top paying jobs in the US were not around 10 years ago. There are new lines of employment. And certainly, persons who we teach now, who we educate now, are being educated to fill vacancies that have not yet been thought about. This is a significant challenge for us. How do we create, how do we educate an employee for a job that has not yet been designed? And I want to leave you with two simple words that I think remains the solution to this problem. The first one is metacognition. Learning to learn. Once we have empowered a child, and that child has mastered the art of metacognition, that child, certainly that learner, becomes a lifelong learner. The concept that we all want to develop in all of us, even in ourselves. 
The other word is what I consider the perfect word in the English vocabulary. And not being a mathematician, I am just assuming that perfection means 100%. When you think of 100, it is almost the perfect number. Yes? Now, if you should make the letters of the English alphabet equate to their numerical representative, with one being A being one, B2 and so forth, you would recognize that there is a perfect word. A word that adds up to 100. And this word isn't knowledge. That stops at 98. Not wisdom. The word simply is attitude. As educators, we must develop in our students the right <laughs> attitude for success. The right attitude for personal, professional, and national advancement. We must develop in our students the right attitude to make them those citizens who, who will personify what is it we hope for Jamaica. That it will be the place of choice to live, work, raise families, do business, and retire with dignity. Please have a beautiful walk. What a beautiful way to end our service. And let us thank our president, Mr. Clayton Hall, in terms of fitting, having such a fitting closure to the theme that was brought on first by Dr. Gaul Morrison. At this point, we will, we will, we will ask Peter Mann to do a presentation for us.